Italian restaurant operated by the Vojkovich family since 1934. It is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Max Durbis Realtors has been providing commercial and industrial real estate services to its clients for nearly 100 years. Since 1934, Max Durbis has been locally owned and operated throughout the greater New Orleans area, including the North Shore, Hammond, and even the Mississippi Gulf Coast and beyond. We focus on your commercial real estate needs so you don't have to. More information is available at 504-733-4555. Good evening and welcome to Primetime Sports. Hey, I'm your host, Scott Alexander, and week one, the first official week of college football, is in the books. And oh, what a weekend it was. It started off, obviously, a Thursday game and a Friday game, but you also had the first game of Saturday. Was a doozy? We all saw it. It was right there. Deion Sanders and the Colorado Buffaloes. They lived up to all the hype, and they were three touchdown underdogs going against TCU, who was in the national championship game last year. And guess what? They led most of the game. Yet yeah, it went seesawing towards the end, but they end up winning a thriller and easily the game of the weekend. 45 to 42. Deion Sanders put his money where his mouth was and he produce that guy right there hunter played 120 something plays i believe on offense and defense he ate the biggest interception of the game and obviously Dion's son who threw for 500 plus yards this guy will be an nfl quarterback one day i can promise you that he is fantastic he accounted for several touchdowns and that is a team on the rise they played nebraska at home for Dion's first home game in Boulder, Colorado this weekend, so that'll be fun. Hey, moving on. It was started there, but it ended last night with another one. Dion was a three touchdown underdog when they won their game outright. Well, how about this? The Duke Blue Devils were two touchdown underdogs to Clemson, top 10 team, number nine in the country, been big bullies of late in the last decade or so. Well, guess what? Duke put it to them early and often. The game was not even that close. I mean, it was 7-6. Clemson had a lead. Duke couldn't, couldn't get things going when they just had to set up for field goals. But boy, when it mattered after that, they got three touchdowns and a two-point conversion. They won this game going away. 28 to 7. That's 22 nothing in the second half. They just actually took it over. Fantastic performance by Duke. Congratulations. That's their biggest win since Spurrier coached Duke back in the 80s and he beat Clemson back then. So this is a big deal for the Duke Blue Devils. Hey, they had a lot in between and particularly locally and not all good. Let's just start with the bad. LSU Tigers. That's right. They had a 17 14 lead at half. You felt pretty good. They didn't look fantastic or anything. They missed some opportunities when they should should have scored on that first drive but you know what they were leading and oh boy what a difference the second half was kind of the difference of last year where Florida State was beating up on LSU for three quarters and LSU all of a sudden came alive and almost came back and won the game last year. Well, this was different. The second half, Florida State showed they are big boys. Jordan Travis right there on the right. What a great quarterback he is. He is fantastic and he has these two great receivers. Johnny Wilson, six foot seven. He was capitalizing early in there. You have that's Wilson there, number 14. You had Keon Coleman, number four, who came from Michigan State. He had three touchdowns receiving and he just got the ball. He, they said, throw it up and I'll get under it and that's exactly what they did. LSU is depleted at cornerback right now and it showed big time on Sunday night. So Tiger fans, this happened last year, wasn't quite a debacle like that one was in the second half, but they got to regroup and see what happens. They got grambling this weekend. Let's go to the good news. Tulane Green Wave. My goodness, they were less than a touchdown favorite against a very good South Alabama team. I told you about them last last year. I was out in the West Coast doing a USC game when South Alabama was across town playing UCLA and they led most of the game and they, they got beat at the very end against a good UCLA team, uh, you know, with Chip Kelly coaching them. So I thought this might be a dangerous game. 
Well, guess what? They proved me completely wrong. They came out and just walloped them. Uh, and it really wasn't close most of the way. They won 37-17 going away. Michael Pratt, what a fantastic guy, player he is. He was the American Athletic Conference Player of the Week. And boy, he is showing everybody that he will be an NFL quarterback. There is zero doubt about that, uh, barring injuries. So congratulations to the Green Wave, and they got a big test ahead of them this weekend. Everybody's looking forward to this one. Ole Miss Rebels are coming to town. This is going to be fantastic. Both teams are ranked. And Tulane, these are old programs right here from the old days. We're going to have Ben Mintz on. We're going to talk about that. He's an Ole Miss alum, Barstool Sports. That's going to be fun. So we're going to talk all about that with him and, and preview that game as well as talk about what happened with LSU. And, of course, the New Orleans Saints. That's right. Their season opens up this Sunday. That's right. At noon against the Tennessee Titans. Tajay Spears, Tulane legend now, and if we can, can we call him a legend already? I am, because this guy led Tulane to a fantastic year last year. He's going to be Derek Henry's backup, but he's going to play a good bit. Trust me on this. He's going to play third downs. He's the speed back. Derek's the big, strong guy. You know, Derek's had a great career for coming out of Alabama. So this should be a big game. The Saints have some question marks. We know it's not a perfect team, but man, if they can stay healthy, there's some positive things that can happen for this New Orleans Saints team, and I'm looking forward to seeing Derek Carr run this team. It's going to be fun. So that will be at noon on Sunday. And also this show, I told you about Ben Mentz. We're also going to have Steve Rehage. Do you remember this kamikaze back from the 80s? One of the best safeties LSU has ever had. Trust me on this. Uh, he was fantastic, and I can't wait to have him. And Rohan Davey, one of the great quarterbacks. Uh, man, I'll never forget that Sugar Bowl performance against Illinois. Seemed like he threw for 800 yards in that game. Rohan Davey has been on the show before, but it's been about five or six years. So I'm looking forward to having Rohan back. He played under Jerry DiNardo and then Nick Saban. So we'll talk all about that coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. I told you we have two LSU legends coming up. Rohan Davey, a quarterback, and also safety Steve Rahage. He was the Honey Badger before the Honey Badger. Trust me, this guy was a kamikaze. But right now, hey, we're going to get all the info you want. First of all, we got one of Barstool Sports' finest. That's right, he's a Louisiana native. He's been in the news a lot. And this guy's an <laughs> old this guy. Uh, he's a guy that loves football. He loves sports in general. And we've been talking about having him on this show for years, and he's finally here. His name is Ben Mintz. Barstool Sports has blown up. If you don't know, ask somebody or at least Google it up because they are all over the place. Dave Portnoy, it was his vision, and I think they had a sale to pen. Or I don't even know what pen is. We're going to find out. <laughs> uh, but here he is, Ben Mintz, Ole Miss yeah. alum. Yeah, here. Uh, thrilled to be here. I've been wanting to come on the show. I mean, you and I have been talking for a couple of years. Yeah. I actually have an old relationship with uh, your brother. Right. That goes back to my childhood. He's a minister. Yep, he's but a no, minister. Whitney Alexander. Let's give him a shout out. Yeah, shout out Whitney. Uh -huh. uh, still close to them over at First Pres, Baton Rouge. Uh-huh. Uh, so thrilled to be here, and uh, what a week in New Orleans. Uh, I'm an Ole Miss alum, Ole Miss Tulane, battle of top 25 teams, 2.30 Saturday. Love that it's a Ullman Stadium. Even though if it's a hotter ticket, it's, I think it's great. And then su it's, Sunday. It's in the afternoon, thanks. right? Yeah. Oh, it's going to be hotter. It's going to be hot. I talked to Deuce about it. He said he's going he's gonna to hold off on this one. Deuce, I was trying to get Deuce to come on your show mm -hmm. this week, and he said hey, he, he's not back till tomorrow, so he's coming on next week to talk about, I don't know if it's going to be a win or a loss, but he's going to talk one way or the other. So what do you think? Let's start there, because I was going to talk about the games first, but let's start – Talk about what you saw from Ole Miss. They they won seven. They scored 73 points. I think I saw a score at seven seven at one time, and next thing I saw it was like 60 to seven. Yeah, it was a scrim. I went Saturday in Oxford. I mean, it was a scrimmage, but I, just Lane Kiffin appreciation because like I was at Ole Miss during the Houston Nut and that Orgeron era where they beat FCS teams like 17 10. Right. I mean, right. you'd have games like that where you'd just be like, man. And then uh, now with the Lane offense, they just come out and they could have scored 100. I thought the interesting observation of the Ole Miss thing was a quarterback battle. When them bringing in Spencer Sanders, who's a four-year starter at Oklahoma State. I've done many of his games. I was, I was going to ask you, why did he come to Ole Miss? Yeah, I don't know. Because he had – Hugh Freeze at Auburn said, hey, you come here, you're the guy. Right. Lane and Kiffin said, you come here, you got to compete. And Jackson Dart beat him out. And Jackson Dart uh, from, from USC. Yeah, from the USC. games with him too over there. Yeah, and like kind of was up and down last year. I actually expected – 
you don't go get a four-year starter and expect him to sit. So I thought Sanders was going to be the guy. You also bring in, you also bring in Walker Howard. Uh, you brought in Walker Howard from LSU yeah. too. So you got a quarter crowd of quarterback room. Uh, but Dart started 11 for 11, and then uh, Louisiana Tech transfer Trey Harris of all the great Ole Miss wide receivers in history sets the school record with four touchdowns. Four touchdowns. Three in the first four minutes. I know. In the first four minutes? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's crazy because I've been in a fantasy league for 30 years with just SEC, ACC teams when I started at Turner oh, Sports. Fun. We've been doing it. Same guys. And I got the other guy that, that I didn't know he was injured, Zachary Franklin. And he, he's the guy from UTSA. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And he got him in the third round. And he didn't play. But Trey Harris, is the second guy, just blew up. Yeah, Franklin's questionable for two lane. They think definitely will be back by Alabama. I thought we had shots of these getting this game. Because, I mean, uh, Ole Miss was all over them. They play Mercer. We get it. But yeah, there you go. We have some of these plays. You, you'll know some of these dudes, but that is that Trey right there? Trey's number nine. Number nine. That's number him. nine. He that's was popping well, on that's the screen. right there. That's Lafayette. a touchdown. Yeah, he was a Lafayette guy. Went to Louisiana Tech. Uh, Glenn Kiffin's done such a good job using the portal. Because Ole Miss, you know, usually you don't pull those top ten recruiting classes out of high school. But, man, he's been going in. He's been hitting the G5. And, uh, you know, scrimmage against Mercer, but hard not to be excited. There's Lane right there. Hey, before we get to, like, LSU, because I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the Saints. Um, Tulane, did you get to see them at all? Yeah, so I admit it. Look, I'm always the first to admit, like, you know, the I'm, I'm involved in the gambling business. I make picks, yeah. that kind of stuff. I always own it when I'm wrong, and I talk smack. Well, I thought like, South Alabama would play the much Me stuff. too. I bet South Alabama, well, and they got destroyed. I said this in the open. I said South Alabama. I was doing a USC game last year when they almost beat UCLA yep. across town in Pasadena, and I'm like, wow, this team's going to be tough for Tulane, especially if they're overlooking them for Ole Miss, which is what I'm sure you factored in as well. Yeah, I did. But I, I was at the game. I, got, I did a Friday game this week, so I came back and went, and I'm like, okay. They were a little clunky in the beginning. Uh, it wasn't like a blowout right away, but then you could see they were a better team. And then Michael Pratt just had, I mean, he just took off where he, where he, he started where he took off from last season, where the, he obviously was the American Athletic Conference Player of the Week, and this guy is going to be a stud. So what do you think about him versus Ole Miss? Man, I think we're going to have a wild game. I think this thing is set up to be not low scoring. Uh, you know, Pratt took big steps forward at the end of last year, obviously led that incredible comeback against USC in the Cotton Bowl. You know, I didn't know how he'd adapt without Tajay Spears, who was just a superstar in that two-lane backfield. And we're going to see him on Sunday playing for the Titans, making his NFL debut in the Superdome. A little irony there, but I thought – I love two, that, though. Yeah, I thought Tulane – you know, look, I think Willie Fritz is a spectacular coach. Yeah. I mean, I think he's phenomenal. I did think, like, man, they were 10. So, this was, this was when y'all beat him 61 to 21. I had these these from – so, I just wanted to – Tulane fans to remember this one. Yeah, yeah, actually. But that was when <laughs> Tulane was on the road dealing with that hurricane. Right, right, right. You know, they had a really tough couple weeks. I heard a lot of stuff. They were mad about their locker room at Ole Miss. I heard there was some kind of behind-the-scenes stuff they're still mad about. Oh, really? So, maybe they'll be a little fired up. I don't know. Like, I – you know, They're far enough for this game, but I mean, Ole Miss is Ole Miss. I mean, here. It's going to be a tough one, though, man. I'm not coming in cocky. Ole Miss six and a half point favorite. Look, Tulane, this is a huge game on their campus. I mean, they just took They're going to be fired up. They're they just took fired. down USC in the Cotton Bowl and yeah. the Heisman Trophy winner. They're not going to be scared of Ole Miss. No. So, I think uh, I think this is one of those games. It's, uh, it's going to just be a bang, bang, tough game. Uh, and also just love seeing, like I said, Yulman Stadium. Yeah. Because Tulane always played in that Superdome, and it just never no, no, felt no, no, organic. No, no, no. You'll see. You're going to love it. If oh, yeah. And I've been before. Oh, okay, you've been. But, okay. I mean, it's hard. Ole Miss only got 3,000 tickets. Right. I mean, it's going to be a pack. No, it's going to be packed. I mean, this is a tough – I have friends that bought season tickets just so they could get this one because on the, on the secondary market, which is all that was available – the games were it was more expensive to get the one game ticket than because they hold back season tickets than to get the season ticket package. So I have friends who just said, "Screw it, I'm getting the season ticket for 400 and opposed to paying 500 on the you know." I know Ole Miss fans that actually bought two oh, season, season, season tickets because, right. because of that exact thing. <laughs> right, right, right. I need to talk to them for future yeah. games then. All right, before we get to LSU and the Saints, I want to talk about your story real quick because okay. listen, you're a Louisiana guy, man. Oh yeah, and you're from Monroe. And you've made it. I mean, you, you're going up to New York, and you were the bar stool, and I, I, I was following your stuff. And I wasn't a bar stool guy originally, but because of you, I started, you know, following all the bar stool stuff. And I'm, I'm following your story. I met you with Josh Booty. I didn't even know you stayed at my house with Whitney when, when I was, I was out 11. of town. Yeah, that's kind of LSU fun. ten seven Clemson Bowl. Win. That's kind of fun and crazy. But I actually, uh, you know, Whitney was at my house because he went to the game, right? Yep. So 
And you're 11 years old. That's yep. too funny. I remember, I think I hit ten balls on your tennis court. Yeah, the tennis court. <laughs> the go. old days, man. There you go. Those are some good old days of the tennis court. 30 years but, ago. But the fact is, is that this, uh, but this, th your career has gone big since you were 11. You're 40 now. Mm. Now you're making me feel really old. But tell me what's been going on. So, tell me your, your whole arc. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give it the Cliff's notes. So I went to Ole Miss. Like, I, was between, I grew up house divided. My dad went to LSU. When my family has a farm in Mississippi Delta, my mom's a big old Miss person. So, like, literally, even when I graduated high school, I still didn't know if I was going to LSU or Ole Miss. So right, it was like right. Wow, okay. So I decided to go to Ole Miss just kind of because I like to Oxford and to do something a little different. Yeah. And basically, about my fifth year at Ole Miss, I got really, really into online poker. Uh -huh. And I started making a lot of money, and it messed with my mind in my early 20s. You know, you think you're invincible and you have money when you're right, gone. Right, 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 right. So I basically quit caring about school and, like, was really good at poker for, for a long time. And I actually moved down here in 2009. This is my New Orleans ties. I lived here from 09 to 14 just playing poker. I'd play at Harrah's. I'd play at Motorbosch Bloxy. And I was – I got So you were in the World Series of Poker, Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got 75th in the World Series main event <laughs> that's, in, in 2011. That's a time, man. Where, yeah, that was the peak of my poker career. But so that was all I did from, like, to, till 2014. And then, like many before and after me, you know, probably overenjoyed myself in New Orleans. Right. When it's, I was in my late 20s. You ain't the first? No, I'm not going to be the last. No, you won't be. I'm not going to be the first or last. And I kind of looked up, and the, the government outlawed online poker in 2011, so that hurt my livelihood. And so in early 2014, I was like, you know what? This isn't working right now. I'm going to go back to school and finish my finance degree. So I go back to Ole Miss when I'm 30 years old. Okay. And so I go and I go. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. Good so, time to so, there. So I go from 75th in the World Series main, like top 200 in the world in poker, to working a part-time job making salads and pizzas in the proud, <laughs> proud Larry's kitchen and finishing school for a year. This is great, man. No, and so I actually was like embarrassed to tell people I had that job. But I look back, and that's the best thing that that's happened to me. That's the greatest, man. Because I hadn't had a job in eight or ten years. Right, like, right. Coming out of the gambling world, my mind was yeah. fried. Right. And That's a whole different world. Yeah, well, and it desensitizes you to money. Uh -huh. And so I came back. I finished school. And I finished my finance degree. I'm like 31 years old. And then I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? And an old, uh, another person knows Whitney, uh, my friend Sean Fox, who does sports radio in North Louisiana, I'm at a funeral. And we, Sean and I leave the funeral, and he's like, well, what do you think about moving to Shreveport? I'm like, What's in Shreveport? He's like, <laughs> he's like, well, they've got a sports radio station. They want to get I going. I guess that's why I thought you were from Shreveport. Right? Yeah, and yeah. they were trying right. to hire Sean, and he had a wife and a kid, and he was running the Monroe station. He's like, I'm going to recommend you for this job. I was like, well, I mean, cool. I'd love to do that, you know. Uh, even though I, I barely had any sports radio experience, I'd just gone on some segments. He's like, well, I'm going to tell him, look, you have no experience, but you know a lot about sports, and you have a funny sure, personality. Sure. So go interview for this, and I get this job. And so – I'm three to six, drive time, Bozier Shreveport, and I get on air the first day. I got a list of notes about 12 pages long. I'm nervous as heck. And I got Sean on the line just in case something goes wrong. I'm talking so fast, I'm so nervous. I go to Sean. The show starts at like 3. I go to Sean at like 3.04 on the line. <laughs> uh, and the first nine months of the show, I mean, I don't. it wasn't very good for a while. But like anything, it's and reps, you know this, man. It's, it's, reps. Reps. it's reps. It's reps. And when you're doing three hours a day, yeah. you know, I kind of learned like people. Oh, I did three hours by myself too for four years. Yeah. And I've never done radio, but the same thing. I just jumped in and ESPN, I was doing their drive time show for, here for a couple of those years. And it's not easy. Mm -hmm. People think because even if you have guests, you got to talk by yourself a lot, too. Yeah, well, what I realized is I did it. It's like you can't fake passion. And I made it more my – instead of doing a generic show, having yeah. beat writers, all that, I started having yeah. a fantasy football hour and right. talking about gambling. And I'd right. talk about cultural stuff. And, you know, it kind of – and I ended up doing Shreveport and Bozier four years. I was there from December 2015 till I got let go on March 9th, 2020, Right when COVID started, when everybody slashed. So this is the where Barstool came in? No, we're, we're almost there. So I get let go early March 2020, and i had been doing stuff. So I've been going on ESPN Baton Rouge with T-Bob. I'm really close to T-Bob. Me too. I love and I was one the of my favorite guys. I was on the gambling, I was the gambling picks guy on off the bench okay. for okay. a couple of years. So I get let go by ESPN Baton Rouge. I mean, not, not by ESPN Baton Rouge, by Shreveport. And I get a call to get hired by ESPN Baton Rouge the next day. And I was like, heck, yeah, this could be awesome. Yeah. Then COVID shuts the world down. Oh, man. And so it's like. Because that was when Jordy kind of left? Was that? This is before that. Okay. Jordy okay. tried to hire me to be the. I was actually hired to be the. No, pre no, I like Jordy to be the too. Jordy three. and T-Bob are two of my good buddies. Oh, yeah, mine too. So I uh, was going to go there. So I'm 
I, I ended up during COVID moving back to Oxford, Mississippi, playing online poker. And I was laughing because it was like, that's all I did in 2006. And then 14 years later, I'm just unemployed playing online poker. I'm like, I've either progressed on as a person or none at all. <laughs> not at all. Or none at all. That's hilarious. So I'm there for three months, and then I get a call from Jimmy Ott, another guy you know. Sure. In early July. ESPN. He was, yeah. And he's, he, been every, he's been all over Baton Rouge. Oh, yeah. One of the first sports talk show guys ever. But yeah, he's been there for 30 years. Yeah. And he hires me to be his number two on his new show in early July 2020. Right. So I take it immediately. I move to the Garden District of Baton Rouge. Uh, you know, I, we had like some night show that was kind of gambling based. And I was the number two guy on that. And I was, look, I like Baton Rouge. I was thrilled to be there. And honestly, I'd been trying to get the ESPN Baton Rouge since I'd been in Shreveport Bossier. I thought that was kind of the logical step. Yeah, time. right, right. So I'm there for three months. And things are going fine. I'm happy in Baton Rouge. And then I'm watching the Ole Miss, it's Lane Kiffin's first SEC game. Okay. I'm watching Ole Miss Kentucky. And Kentucky, it's overtime. Kentucky scores and misses an extra point. And then Elijah Moore scores on a touchdown for Matt Corral. So Ole Miss scores, kicks the extra point, and wins. I do a social media media video, honestly, kind of just messing around, uh -huh. of me ripping the hottie toddy, like super hyped. And I put it on the internet just for content, you know, not, yeah. not thinking of it. And Sunday morning, I'm driving to Natchez, Mississippi, and I, me and Rowan Davey, who you're, who's going to be part of today's show, one of my good buddies, him and I and I do the Sunday morning ESPN show oh. at the sports book in Natchez. On my way to Natchez, my phone goes off like a nuclear cannon. <laughs> And I look down, and it's Dave Portnoy retweeting SEC football. It's different. It's my idiotic self. Oh, my yelling, God. Yelling wow, the hottie this is how it started? Yep. Yelling the okay, hottie. That's Dave. Who, look, yep, to let that's people the day know. I got hired. I'm a little smaller now. That's right when I got hired. And he's the founder of oh, yeah. this. Okay, so, yeah, he's, he's, he's not poor. Okay. No, 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 no. So, I'm, I'm just ripping the hottie toddy. So, Dave hits me up. SEC football, it's different. Then Dave DMs me, and I'm like, and Dave follows me on Twitter, and he DMs me. And I pull in the parking lot, Natchez, and he's like, is that you on the video? And I said, dang right, that's me. <laughs> and he's like, we're ready for you to come work for us at Barstool. No interview. No nothing. Nothing. And, and then we, he calls me the next day, and I'm in Natchez, and I said hello. And the first thing he said, he goes, your voice sounds exactly like the hoped it would, but the uh, southern draw I right. got. Yeah. And he goes, listen. So how was that New York experience? Yeah. So, I moved, so basically, he gave me the option of moving to New York or staying south. But I realized, I was like, man, I've been grinding forever. I've done Bozier four yeah. years. I went back to school. New York, dude. Yeah, I, I got to do it. Come on, of course So I move up in the middle of the pandemic in October, and I knew two people. I didn't know anybody in Barstool. And, I, I, I mean, I went so up there. So this is 2020. Yeah. Okay. And, I stay, and I thought I rocked it pretty good. I mean, New York, you know, it, it, the, the problem Oh, is, I started seeing you. Like I said, this guy's moving up, man. All right. Yeah. It, the New York thing, I mean, it's just very, very expensive, you know. I haven't joined the Mincy Mafia. I got an invite request. I said, hell, I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, but so, yeah, did the New York thing, just went in there and kind of found the thing with Barstool, Dave always says this, it's unlike any other media company because he, he never, they give you no direction. They just are like, I came in the first day. They're like, here's your desk. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> and they're literally like, like, here's a laptop. They're like, figure it out. That's literally, they give you, he's like, he said, we hire really creative, talented people and we give them no direction. That's what Dave says about Barstool. But I found a niche with it being just there were Brandon Walker was there from Mississippi State and Casey Smith ran him. But I was kind of the third, yeah, the, third the third Southern guy there. And so we were kind of there to build the SEC and the South brand Barstool, which is such a big Massachusetts, New York, Philly, Chicago company. And, you know, it kind of blew up. I was there two years and went well. Let me move back to New Orleans the beginning of this year. Um, and, you know, that's a whole Where thing. are you living now, bud? So I live uptown and kind of off the pole in St. Charles. Okay. Yeah. Right. And so I'm back. Yeah. Small stomping grounds. Yeah, I love it. Faces. Love it. Uh, you know, well, I, then we're going to have you on kind of regular, if you don't mind. Oh, you yeah. Know? Well, it's going to be every next couple months because I'm facing I'm facing the Chicago move. Oh, you're facing yeah. the Chicago they, move. They, so well, I didn't get to t t the whole story. We're going to get the rest of this, dude. Oh, yeah, we'll do it. And if it wasn't Rohan and Steve, I would just say, yeah. hey, I'll, I'll, I'll cut some time. I'm a long-winded long man. But no, no, it was good. Yeah, I, I mean, now I think we know you a little bit more. I'm gonna have to get the LSU uh, talk. I got two What's LSU that? guys. They can yeah. talk about the LSU. Yeah, game. we get LSU on this week in a couple weeks. Yeah, that's right. We got that. Are you gonna weeks. still be around then? Oh yeah, well, I'm, here. Get, I'm here until November. Let's schedule that one. It's in October, right? Yeah, like September 30th. Why oh, are September they, 30th. You all miss playing in September. Well, we'll do that one. Let's do, do that one because that hey, this ain't get enough, and all I right. need you need more time. All I can right. see that. All right. And generally, I would. I I miss I miss scheduled this. I should have kept you with just one other guest. No worries. Task performance. Have you had one of these? I have before? not, but it looks amazing. Are you kidding me? It looks great. Okay, task. 
it, you'll never get another shirt. I promise you. I'm not even joking. No, it looks amazing. Feels it's very the softest shirt I've ever. I threw away all my Under Armour and Nike Dry Fit after. Now it's all I wear. And here, this is. Oh, you live there? Delachaise is right down the street. This is for Delachaise or Shays Delachaise. Delachaise is right there on right. Yeah. By Louisiana. Awesome. And yeah, there you yeah, go, great. Bro. Yeah, big fan. And then Chase Delachaise on Maple. That's more of a sit down. It's yeah, no Delachaise. Yeah, man, uh, I will be going to ben, there. Dude, I wish I had more oh, time. Oh, great see you, Scott. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we just we just broke the seal. We're gonna do this a little yeah, more we'll often. Until we move to Chicago. Yeah. Sorry, I was a little long winded. That's yeah. all good. No, no, it was right. Hey, it's been Mintz. Check him out. Barstool Mincy? Yeah, at Stool, Min at Stool Mincy on Twitter and Instagram. Is it at Stool Mincy? Yes, it's Stool. Yes, T O L. Okay. Somebody stole Barstool Mincy after I got fired, but that's for another time. Yeah, that's for another time. <laughs> this guy's got a lot of personality. <laughs> and who, I didn't know my brother would get a couple shout outs yeah, to this yeah. segment, but Whitney, there you go, my brother. Papa Wit? Yeah, Papa Wit. Hey, hey, coming up, I told you, we teased it earlier. Look at him. He's getting some love right here. Yeah, I'm pumped about that. Yeah, give him a little, little shot of that. He's showing off those wares, baby. Yeah. All right, so we got coming up. Steve Ray Hodge is going to be last next. We got Rohan Davey, LSU quarterback in the late 90s and early 2000s. One of the greatest Sugar Bowl performances I've ever seen. And we'll talk about that when he comes on right here on Primetime Sports. Inspired by the culture and spirit of New Orleans, the contemporary abstract and figurative work of Tony Mose and the urban expressionist art and jewelry of Tracy Mose are now on display and available at Isom Art Galleries. Isom Art Galleries are artist owned and are located in Uptown New Orleans on Magazine Street and on Royal Street in the heart of the French Quarter. Isom Art Galleries, inspiration from the soul of New Orleans. Rock and roll will never die. It's old New Orleans, my oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and roll at the city lane. Oh my, let's roll, let's rock and roll. Baby, do the rock and roll at the Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. Hey, listen, man, we've had a little run of LSU quarterbacks and other Tulane. We had a couple great Tulane quarterbacks come on about a month ago. Last week, we had Herb Tyler. Wickersham's coming up. We're going to get Hodson in here. Josh Booty was on a couple weeks ago. But, man, if you want to look at a scintillating performance, one of the best I've ever seen, Go to the, watch the Illinois LSU Sugar Bowl. My man, Rohan Davey, who was one of the biggest recruits in the country. Trust me, because I was running one of the biggest <laughs> recruiting shows out of Atlanta. It was a national show called Countdown to Signing Day. We were on this guy for two years, and finally we were like, we were featuring him. Where is he going to go? Is it going to be Miami? All of a sudden, you know, I'm an LSU grad. When I heard LSU popping up, I was like, okay, this is nice. And he decided to go to LSU. He became a legend there, and he still lives in Baton Rouge, the capital city. Here he is for the first time on this show in five or six years. Rohan Davey, my man. Good to see you, bro. What's happening, baby? Everything good? Everything is wonderful. When I look back at that, that's over 25 years ago. A long time I remember ago. we were making calls, you know, you know, we had to get the latest information, and Jamie was Count the one. Countdown to signing day. Countdown to signing day, dude. I mean, that's that's more than half your life ago. Oh, absolutely. And it was a very good time in my life, though. Right. You I were mean, getting recruited getting rec by everybody? Yeah. Tell us about that, man. I mean, you know, when anytime you 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 want it and people make you feel wanted, it feels good. It's got to you know be the mean? greatest time. I mean, honestly, when you get on campus, obviously they got you, especially yeah. back then. There was no portal where you could get leave if you want. But they were courting you. You're getting all the, you know, maybe some enticements. I don't know. Oh, yeah. But the fact is, is that you had the biggest of the big going for you. So when you came down to it, what made LSU be the choice? The people. The people. Period. It was Well, let me say that it was the people and the fact that I saw them. I wanted to stay in the SEC, uh -huh. and I saw them play a black quarterback. Right. And right. I wanted to Her. stay right. as a black quarterback. A lot of other teams in the SEC and just around the country recruited me as an athlete right. and wanted me to come play a different position. Right. I but, remember there was talk yeah. a linebacker even, you know, maybe tight end and, and fullback. I don't know. Yeah, the thing that's so unbelievable about all that was, I've never played another position. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, I'm serious. I mean, I played a little safety early on, but I've never 
played the positions that these people that I was getting that they was recruiting right. me for wanted to switch me to. I never played it. So my thing That's, was, how the hell y'all know I could play exactly, it? Exactly. Okay, you're having a flashback. I had an early do set on my show years ago. And early, you know, if you if you didn't watch early, look at him, and he's talking, you would think he's like a seventy year old Cajun white man. Yeah, like because he said he's a Cajun, but he's a young black man, a great. Yeah. But he goes, Scott, Scott, they they say I'm the number one wide receiver in the country. Well, I've never even played a position. I don't know how to play. I play quarterback. Right. <laughs> I'm just sitting there like, and I'm like, well, you're projected, and you end up being a big time. Oh, he was a big time wide LSU. receiver. Well, it's yeah. wide receiver, but. But your era there, I mean, you have a, an interesting thing. Because I've had a lot of guys on this show that have played for both Saban and Les Miles, right? But mm -hmm. I can't think of a whole lot of them that I've had that had played for Les, uh, Saban and Jerry DiNardo, who mm -hmm. I love as well. <laughs> Jerry's a trip, right? Yeah. But you played for both. You were yeah. under you under DiNardo for three years. One was a red shirt. And then you were with Saban, I believe, for two years. Correct. And so what was that dichotomy like between those two guys? It wasn't even close. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, There's no, they, night and day. Night and day. Bro. Night and day. Night and day with how they went about their business. Yeah. Night and day with how they treated players. Everything was night and day. Night and day. Um, the way you prepare, the attention to detail, everything was different. Save, for the better. Saving something else with that, right? Yeah, he's different. He's just different. Yeah, he's the, he's, I shouldn't even say just like what they're the same. He's a Belichick. He's you know, a Belichick. He is a lot a like Belichick. I even told Jay Johnson, the LSU baseball coach, who was here last week. Uh, he he's a lot like Saban, except he's he's not as angry as Saban. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> no, but he's the detail man. Every yeah, no. Of his day is is and focused. it's very regimented. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's not broke. Don't fix it. Let's enhance it, make it better. And what we are not as good at, let's make that really bad. Let's really focus and work on that. And there's a, there's a process to everything. I'm going to take you back because I had Herb on last week, too. And I, I mean, I was living in Atlanta during this time, but I'm an LSU grad. I went there uh, back in the 80s. And I'm going to say this. That team had six bad years, but my years there, 36-6 and two. That was a regular season record. 36-6 mm. and two. And they, they just were one and three in the bowls. But the fact is, is they were rolling. But they got bad, man. Yeah. They started losing, and you kind of got on the beginning of them winning You're again. You're talking about at the end of the Coach DiNardo. Well, I'm talking about, like, they got bad with the end of Archer's time, and then, yeah. then you had Curly Holman, yeah. and then the beginning of DiNardo, he took over. Good. Yeah, right. right. Took, yeah, then he got – but he could have been – my point is, he could have been in 98, your redshirt freshman year – he could have run for governor and won. By the end of the season, by all those losses. It was over. It was over because he it, lost every excruciating game. And he, they had four sale signs in his front yard by the well, end of the season. Well, the problem was their Coach D lost the team. Yeah. He lost the team completely by how he was conducting himself and how he was treating players, yeah. talking to them, demeaning them, and also how he treated the coaches in front of the players. So now your players really don't got too much respect for you as right. their coach because you're a grown man getting talked to and demeaned just like us. So sure. it's like you're on yeah. our level. Right. You know what I mean? So Coach D completely lost the team by the end of that year. We were super talented. Right, because, okay, I remember 10-2, the year you were being recruited, they were 10-2, and, and that's the first time they had the double digits since yeah. my era there yeah. uh, as, a, as a student, not yeah. a player, obviously. But the fact is, is then, then you had 97, another good year, and I remember the, the turning point game because I believe LSU started 3-0. and They had Georgia freshman Quincy Carter was playing. Yep. Champ and, Bailey. And I, Champ Bailey, all these guys had been yep. live on my show back in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. And we, I brought all these Georgia fans, 60 of them, and we flew to New Orleans, had a big night Friday. We took a bus, you know, cocktails on the bus. It was like five LSU fans in 55 Georgia. Yeah. And, uh, and that game was the turning point because it was like 28-26. Yeah. But every game after that, it just seemed like LSU was losing. Find a way to lose. They had two touchdown lead in yeah. South Bend over Notre Dame. Alabama, they had some crazy things happen at the end every game. Yeah. So does that get in your head once you start losing? It's like it becomes contagious? Well, it's, it's hard to stop it. Because you weren't getting blown out. That's no, the thing. It's, it's hard to stop it when you basically, like, you fighting against each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, right. we ain't fully, that, that year, I remember that year so good. We didn't fully, feel, uh, we didn't fully trust yeah. the coaches. Uh-huh. Right? And then, so once you started losing, then everything became a little bit divisive. 
So the guys that are playing, that are out there physically out in the game, and as opposed to the guys that aren't, now you're looking at and saying, well, now I, maybe I should be out there. Maybe yes, this. Yes. And I mean, I ain't going to lie, me personally, that was my thoughts. Sure, sure. You know, just as a competitor, as wanting to, do you think that? And then when you eternally how things are going within the family, which is the football program, sure. that nobody outside knows that you try to keep in-house, those in-house problems that you try to keep in-house or, the, or what's causing the problems and now it's becoming combustible. You know, bro, I, I've always wanted to ask you this because I, I remember my first year doing that countdown of Sunday Day Show was like 93, 94. And we brought Peyton Manning up, but we also brought Josh Booty. Mm -hmm. And Josh was the number one quarterback in the country, number one player. He was player yeah. of the year USA Today. That, that full color thing, he's Shreveport guy from Evangel. He broke all the records. And he decided to go play baseball. He's a top five pick, and he left. And but he became this mythical f creature at LSU. Like, hey, he committed to LSU. He signed the biggest uh, signing bonus in the history of the major league draft. But when he came back, and you're you're, I think after your second year, maybe I don't sure when he came. Maybe it's after your first year. Yeah. But when you heard this guy's coming in. And you're like, oh, my God, he gave up his baseball career, and he's an older guy now, and he's going to come at LSU. What was your first thought process? Did you even know who he was, first of all? The first time I ever heard of Josh Booty was a reporter asked me when I was getting recruited in high school my senior year um, about him. I didn't know and who he was. he was with the Marlins. That's what I'm saying. He was with the, the Marlins. You lived in Miami, yeah. right? Yeah. So somebody asked me about that because I think little rumors and stuff – has they started, started they back start then. They up, right, yeah, yeah. So they asked me about it, and I, I didn't know who he was. Right, right. I was like, you know. Yeah, you were I in eighth just, grade yeah, when he was Yeah, I didn't know nothing. Right, I was right, like, right, right. But at the time, I was a senior. I was like, you know, whoever, if he comes, he comes. His, my decision is not based on what right. he does. I don't even know who he is, so on and so forth. But then, you know, when you fast forward, you got here, and now, you know, I'm playing with his brother, Abram, who was in the same recruiting class. Great guy. Oh, oh yeah, fantastic receiver. Mm -hmm. um, and now – with him, now that you're getting the rumors and everything about him coming. I'll be honest with you, my whole thing with, with that was, I really didn't care. Yeah. My whole thing with it was, let's just see, because I hadn't been in college a little bit already, and so I knew what favoritism and stuff like that looked like. Yeah. And so I just wanted to know was everything on an even surface? I don't care about a guy well, coming exactly in and compete. That's exactly what I want to know because I, when I'm in Atlanta, I knew what a big recruit you were. I mean, I, this was what we were doing. They, we did a 20-week series of it, right? So we talked about you all the time. And you were great in your own mind, right? You know, but you, this is a guy that was the player of the year. He beat Peyton Manning out for the number one player. That had, in my mind, I'm thinking, what's, what's Ro got to be thinking right now? Yeah, no, nah, I ain't even know that, though. I yeah. didn't know, like, all the stats and all that stuff. I started hearing it more, player of the year, stuff like that, when he came here. But I promise you, honestly, I, it didn't matter. What was your relationship? Josh and I, while we were in school, had a... I mean, you like a workman-like right? yeah. relationship. Yeah, we didn't hang out together. We didn't go drinking together or nothing like that. Like we had a workman-like relationship, and when we left there, we left there. Me personally, I oh, I thought when Josh came, I thought Josh was arrogant. Yeah. I yeah. thought he was a little bit, a lot of full of himself, and I thought most of, and but then I thought most of it was based on because he had money and been out in the baseball been out, world been and been out in the city. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So we were kids. Right. Josh smoking big stogies. We smoking right. black and mild. Right, right, you right. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right, so right. it was that type of type of thing. So we never really it, it had to be weird for yeah. the rest of the team for this guy that's made all this like, money. Man, Josh used to come in the in the locker room drinking champagne. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's yeah. So I'm just saying it, it was that type of dynamic. So it wasn't like I didn't like him or he didn't like me. We didn't know each other. And it was, I think there was some kind of like just built up friction because we were competing. Yeah. We were competing for a position, you know what I mean? And honestly, it was always that underlining, well, is it going to be favoritism? Is it going to go right? Are they going to get, is the white quarterback going to get it? Is they going to get a black quarterback a fetch hand? Like, is Donardo or is he in love with the new toy now, which is Josh? Yeah. It was all those things that goes, that we, that I talked about, I know, with a couple of my close guys that I was cool with. And just, 
to sit and see. Because there was a bunch of times I thought about transferring. Yeah. It was times where it was real difficult. I, and I, yeah, you had you to know what I mean? Yeah. It, right? I mean, hundred percent, hundred percent, and more than a couple times. You know what I mean? It was times where, you know, like for the Alabama Alabama game, for example, where I'm thinking that I should have got an opportunity to play in that game. But then we go out and we play so hard, and then at the end of the game, we that have an opportunity crazy. to win the game. And it's like, it don't go that way. How about Georgia? That's what I'm saying. It's all low. So you just start questioning yourself whether or not, well, can you really play at this level? You know, is wow. this guy really that much better than you? Or is this guy really better than you? Or if a guy goes out and doesn't play well consecutively and you don't get an opportunity, then it's like, well, maybe I'm not as good as this guy so I need to go somewhere else and go down because if he's playing like this and I can't get on the field then I'm no better than him in their eyes so I'm never going to get on the field here if I'm not better than what I'm seeing out on the field right now so I need to go so all those things run through your mind. I remember you threw for like 3,700 yards and that wasn't happening a whole right. lot. I mean you know you had your warfles you had but that really was not happening. And, and Especially not in our system. And not in your system. I mean, right. I'm, I, wanna, I tell people this all the time about you. I said, you have to understand, man. When this guy came in, he was putting up numbers we just hadn't seen at LSU. Okay? We just hadn't. And that had to give you some kind of gratitude. I, I don't want to speak for you, but what would that feel like for you when you proved, hey, man, I could have been doing this all along? It pissed me off. Yeah. For real. Yeah, right. <laughs> Honestly. Um, I'm glad you're honest yeah, about this. it does. And just going through it for such a period. I, and I mean, even, you know, because I've talked to Coach Donato. Donato's like sent messages back to mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you know. And, Hollingsworth, yeah. yeah. Right. And just on. That's right. I go to dinner with, that's who yeah. I go with. That's right. For and Linda's situation. And John Brady. And yeah. that guy. Right, right, right. That's my guy, too, Coach Mine Brady. Mine, too. Right on. I love Coach Brady. Uh huh. But yeah, it does. It, it makes me mad because I. I, I I would love to have had a bigger sample size. Yes. I would have loved to have pushed for a national championship legitimately. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of those things could have been accomplished if the right decisions were made earlier and people weren't making decisions for whatever other reasons. But the one thing I always go back to, so it does piss me off, but it doesn't anymore because the good Lord don't make mistakes at all. And so everything that happened to me at LSU throughout my whole time there, all it has done is prepared me for life. That's and a great that's way a to look blessing. at it. It's and a blessing. I wouldn't do it any different way. Ascension Christian, you're coaching now. But I, I, I can't let you go without talking about you, just briefly about your time with Tom Brady. Obviously, Super Bowl. I have a picture of you holding up. Yep. I mean, this is the pinnacle, man. Yeah. I mean, you, you won the SEC championship. Right, yeah. and LSU hadn't done that in years when you did that. Yeah. And then you know you, you got the Sugar Bowl, yeah. you got the MVP. I mean, you've had a lot of great things. There you are holding the Super Bowl. What's it like? I'm not just talking about playing with the goat, Tom Brady, yeah. but just your time with Belichick. Uh, you, 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 that's right. You had Belichick and Saban. That's another twosome that not many people have had. So talk about that a little bit. Is you know you, you always go through life, and when you're going through life. Well, I've gone through life. Sometimes you don't appreciate what you're going through because you have that driven feeling. You have that drive to be great, to be greater, to always get higher, always get higher. And so you always think that what you're getting higher for is to win a Super Bowl or what you're getting higher for is whatever it is that you're doing at the time. All Everything that you just talked about prepared me for everything I'm doing now, which is being a father, about to be a husband, uh, all the little things, raising kids, raising these young men that I coach, and using the knowledge that I've gotten from Bill, from Charlie Weiss, from Josh McDaniels, from the great Tom Brady, being around and understanding and seeing how it's done the right way. The right way, man. That's the biggest thing I, I would never, I don't care about not starting over Tom and not doing that. Of course, while you're in it, you want to compete, you want to do us, and we did those things. But the knowledge, the way to do it, I, I could never have gotten it anywhere else. And you got Kevin Falk as a teammate. I mean, I mean, big brother. I mean, in the, I mean, just that's my big brother. Like Herb couldn't stop talking about Kevin. That's Kevin my was big on. Brother. Kevin to me was a bigger star th than Peyton or Josh when he came on our show. When we got Kevin, Kevin was the number one player everybody wanted. We all knew Josh and Peyton, but right. to me, Kevin was the dude, and he is still the all-time. And just SEC. the best 
person. The greatest guy, right? This Kev's a better. That's my guy. That's and my you big are brother. as well, man. All the people you mentioned are the guys I love too. I mean, yeah. like, I'm talking Brady, Hollingsworth, all these guys. Oh but here, God. I've got this. I'm going to give you another gift certificate too because I like you so much, Mr. John Steakhouse. I've realized I had Let's an extra it. one that I didn't know I had Let's do it. for Chase De La Chays. So we're going to give you go. two. You came Let's all the way from it. Baton Rouge. Task performance. That's the softest shirt you'll ever put on. I promise you this. The softest. You sure? 100% bamboo cotton. Uh, I just told Ben Mintz earlier, I said, listen, I threw away my Under Armour and I threw away my dry fit. Way for this. Way better. I be promise you, you're going to be calling me in a week and go, Scott, where can I get more of those? All right. There he is, Rohan Davey, everybody. You, baby. Hope you got to see a little other side of Rohan, a great human being, besides being a great football player. We got a lot of great football players. When you get the combo of being a great person, those people need to be in your life. All right, hey, coming up next, another great guy. Whoa, I can't wait for him. <laughs> uh, he was a guy that when I bartended at Fred's in Baton Rouge after games, trust me, him and Hudson and all the other, Wickersham, who all the guys he played with, they would pile in there and we had a blast. So he's coming up next right here, Safety Steve Ray Hodge. He was second in the SEC in interceptions in 85. He had some great years. His last three years, those guys went 26, 5, and 1 wow. in his last three years at LSU. Coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. is the way Steve Rahage played football. I'm going to tell you this. As a student at LSU when he was there his last three years, LSU was 26-5-1 in the regular season. What a great run. And even the year after he left where they set the tone, that team went 10-1-1. Mm -hmm. So that LSU squad with Tommy Hodson and Wickersham before him was great. And that's Steve Rahage was a safety. He had four interceptions at, in 1985. But Steve, Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you, man? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I remember the days when I was bartending at Fred's, and you know, I'd watch these plays. Sometimes I'd be at the game and just go bartend right after. Sometimes I'd just watch it on TV. But you were just a <clears> fan <throat> favorite because you were definitely that. And I talked to Tommy Hudson about you recently. He goes, "My the best teammate I've ever had." You're talking about a guy that's an All wow. SEC quarterback multiple times. He had the SEC passing record when he left. So when you hear stuff like this and people talk about you, because your name always brings up great memories for certainly people in my era. It's a special time, I think, you know, being at LSU during that time, and I think just the, the teammates, and I think you saw when I walked in with Rohan, right? It's, yeah. It's just a instant It's a family, connection. man. Yeah, it's a family, It's definitely right? a family. So, you know, Tommy, Wick, all those guys, we're all still in touch, and you know, there's a big, uh, big love there. Y'all have some characters. I'm gonna go there first because I was going through some of the roster things, people I remember. I mean, you were even showing me Mike Cobb, who was my little league teammate, and I <laughs> love Mike. I played high school football, I played sports with him, and and he just passed away, unfortunately. But when I go through the people, the Eric Andel sex, you know, uh, Nacho Albergamo, you know, Michael Brooks. I mean, we have shots of all these guys. What's some of the camaraderie? You remember you mentioned Wickersham, and obviously, uh, you know, there's Andelsek right there with the Lions too. But they had some characters on these teams, man. And you were there for four years and started just about every game. Uh, that's true. Um, a lot of characters, especially you know, it was between the uh, Stovall and Charlie Mack years. So you had, you know, well, part of those recruits. Yeah, you had the end of the, end of the Charlie Mack guys. Yeah. And you got, did you red shirt? I did. So you red shirt 82. Yep. The year they, they went to the Orange Bowl. Yep. And then you had, uh, then they, the not so great a year the next year, right? Yep. And, and then Orange Barger came And in. then Orange Barger, who coached the Dolphins, and I know we have shots of all these guys, came in and, and changed the culture and you guys started winning. But talk about those different eras and different people. Well, when I first got there, the defense was largely the McClendon team. Yeah. You know, and that was Blood Williams and Ramsey Dardar and uh, some legends you know, right there. The whole Leonard Marshall still around, maybe? Yeah. 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 Some big boys. I mean, all of those guys went to the NFL. I, you know, ran into Leonard when I spent the 
day in the New with the New York Giants. That's right. You're a New York That's Giant. Right, People know. forget that. <clears throat> I got the I got the logos. Ottawa Rough Rider too. Bonnable uh, you know. Bonnable Bruin. Exactly. John Curtis. But you know what? When I got to the Giants, Leonard was like, "Can't mess with my boy." So you know. He, nice. he gave me the street cred there. That's nice. When you get somebody backing you like that. Yeah. But what, what's your favorite time at LSU? What was it? What was my favorite time? Yeah. What's your was, favorite was, like? When I was there. The whole time. Yeah. The whole time. I remember after my first game, which was uh, Oregon State. It was the first. First game you played in. It was my red shirt game. Oh. First oh. season. Oh, wow. So, you know, I hadn't spent a whole lot of time at Baton Rouge. It was felt very foreign from growing up on, you know, St. Claude Avenue. And you, you know, you get there and then all of a sudden you're in Tiger Stadium three weeks later and it's just mind blowing that, you know, go through those goal posts. And I remember after the game I uh, went up to Pete Jenkins who had recruited me. You what know, a great the, the legendary yeah. coach and I was Love like him. Coach, if I never play it down here, this was the greatest night ever. <laughs> and, and Pete looked at me and goes, if you never play it down here, we've just got it. <laughs> you screwed it up. Huh? All right, we're going to have to get the beef on this one. All right. But, but my man, let me tell you this. I mean, when y'all, you, you had the, the. I didn't know there was a George Snowball's, Carlton thing going it's on. It's all here. good. Snowball's last season, you know, it's surprising. They went to the Orange Bowl, and all of a sudden they go four and seven. And then they bring in this guy, Orangeberger, who's like a little guy, right? I mean, he's not like a, I mean, he's like, he's a pro coach. He was a, a coordinator. I don't think he was ever really a head coach, but he, he won Super Bowls, right? I think he was a defense coordinator with the Dolphins. And I know he went to the Super Bowl with Sh Marino. Shula never won a Super Bowl without him. Without him. And then the one year he coached for the New York Giants and then came back to the, to the Dolphins. So yeah. he won with the Dolphins and the Colts then, because Shula won with the Colts. Was he yep. with them back then, too? Yeah. So he, he, he was only there three years, but he won for three years. Yep. I mean, he won, and he ends up leaving and going to become, says he retired, and then he became Florida's athletic director. Yep. Remember, is, remember it well. Which is interesting. But during that era, you know, we, you, I had Jim Hickey on the other day, who we had dinner with. He played for Georgia, and all he could remember about playing against LSU was getting walloped by Eric Hill, right? The great Eric Hill. But... We had, uh, you know, that Georgia game, and you weren't there still in 87 when they went to Georgia, but in 86, uh, did we take care of business in, in, in LSU Stadium? We did. So two years in a row we beat them. Yeah. But when you go, when you think of the games, like Alabama, when Ronnie Lewis, who missed two field goals, we were dominating Alabama in my opinion, and we ended up tying him. But I remember the last drive because they came and tied the game. They were down 14-7. And we drove it down to the to like the ten yard line or even inside. I'm glad you're passing up that last drive there. Tell me what happened. You know, four, oh, because fourth and seven. Oh, that's a fourth, fourth and, and nineteen. Se fourth and nineteen. Fourth and nineteen, Mike Shula. That's right. That could be the game over. And what happened? I was on. Uh, was this Bell? Yeah. The, the All American wide receiver. Yes, yes, yes. Albert yeah. Bell. Albert no Bell. relation to Joey Albert Bell, right? And he came off the line and. You know, took a step outside and my elbow crossed his helmet. That's and, right. You know, his head snapped back and they threw a personal foul. So they got and the, then, he, then he ended up catching it anyway. The on the pass on the, anyway, right. I forgot, okay, I, I didn't mean to bring it up, but the worst thing, Ronnie so, Lewis, though, shoots the bird at the, at the stands. I mean, I'll never forget this. I'm in the stands and I'm like, this guy just missed a 24-yard field goal and he missed two earlier. The, this would have beaten Alabama, and you, that, you never, you, those last three years, I know you didn't lose to Alabama because you beat them twice and you tied them. Uh, but that tie was a win, and Alabama got lucky to even tie it, and then we had the drive to take it. But when you look at that, that series, and everybody thinks Alabama was winning forever, but that really wasn't the case. Well, I think we lost that one on a field goal. We lost Ole Miss on a field goal. It was, you know. And two there weren't many losses in that era. Right, right. That's two other conference championships you could have had right there. Ronnie missed one, and um, there was a game we were playing in Kentucky who was always at that point like the meanest team ever. Never won anything, but right. just playing them. They were scrapped. Oh. So, so I blew my knee out. Tommy hudson has got his, did his tongue, did his tongue off. Yeah. Basically, they had to go in and sew it. I so we're, we're on the sideline talking to each other, and he's like just knocked out talking crap. And, I remember both of us standing next to Coach Onsberger trying to talk our way back into the game, and Ronnie misses a field goal, and Ronnie Lewis, and he comes walking off, and he, <laughs> Onsberger stops talking to us. He goes, hold on one second. Ronnie, take a seat. You'll never kick at LSU again. He was and like was 3 like, of 14 at one time. Yeah, he was awful, man. And, he, and he's, 
shooting the bird at the fans, but I remember the game because it was a day game. Y'all came back late on a flight, and I was bartending at Fred's again, and Tommy would come in a lot after games. He might have been dating Andy, I don't know, at the time, whoever he was. But he'd come in, and, and I said, man, why? I heard your mouth was like almost severed off. And he goes, yeah, I got stitches. He could barely talk. So he orders what he always got, the fresh squeezed screwdriver. And I'm not even thinking. So he took one sip in the acid in the screwdriver. He's like, ah! Oh. And then, you know, he had stitches in his mouth. But when you think back after leaving, you, did you think, because you went to the Giants, and you know, you say you said Leonard Marsh, you got in a game, or maybe two or three games. Uh, what was that like wearing a Giant uniform? Bill Parcells is the coach, right? I mean. Yeah, Belichick was the coordinator. It's crazy, isn't it? I, mean, I, I, remember, I remember the first game sitting on my helmet and going, like, you know, this, this is kind of crazy. But also, it's nothing compared to, to Tiger Stadium. Really? Yeah. The, well, ener the energy, lands. yeah. I mean, you don't get anything like Tiger Stadium. Nothing, is it? I, I, I grew up, obviously, going to Tulane LSU games, and I thought, you know, the rest of the country. I produce games all over the country, and I've now been to every Power 5 stadium, and there really is nothing like LSU. I mean, there's, the rest of the SEC is really good. And then other than that, only Wisconsin really gets as crazy as we do down here. I mean, they get nuts, and they, they, yeah. but they're not the history we are. But it's interesting because it's like when you grow up with something you think. I can't let you go because we're going to have you on – whenever you can in the next couple months before the season's over because coming in last is not the best place to be when you got people that can talk but I got to talk about Voodoo Fest you started this thing in 1999 you know mm -hmm. went for 25 years and I'm not saying what the future <clears throat> is but when you had this vision man and and it grew so fast like I know your first year was like any first year thing you know you probably took some lumps right but talk about how this started in two minutes and how you ended up where it ended because you you get the biggest of the best and y'all got voted best festival many times well, i think it's one of those things when you know you're a certain age you know and you're late 20s early 30s which i think when i started it i was 27 it just you know Maybe. You're, you're trained at lsu you're trained to play football right you, the whole mindset is you're invincible you know they do Run through the wall. Keep Your math might be wall. a little off. Maybe you were mid-30. Because I know I was 30 in 1995. I think it was uh, 30. Yeah, I'd you started in 99? 36, maybe. Somewhere up in there. <laughs> right. um, then again, I shouldn't be. But the, the be business starts, okay. Yeah, way before. You started and, this And process, then you're right. thinking, like, you're just dumb enough not. I don't know if I'd do it again, right? It was. It's just such a crazy business, and it was so hard to pull off. Um, but it ended up in a great place. I love it. It's a very special event. You, know, you had mentioned earlier the, the 2005 event, which oh my God. I would say was the, hard, was the hardest thing I've ever done. And at the end of it, the most beautiful thing I've ever done. How did you pull that off? I only got a minute. But how did you? Because the city was still in ruins. Okay, I came back for the first time, and that was two months later. And I'm like, I was shocked. I hadn't seen the city. I thought it would be a little big better off it was hard it and was then y'all y'all moved it to the fly right because city park was in tatters well we originally moved it to memphis and uh. then we were doing a walkthrough and it was 10 days out and i remember just like walking off and throwing up because it it just didn't feel right it was like making me sick worrying about it and i called ray nagan and i was like listen i think i'm gonna move it back it's like 10 days out right and he's like you know, Steve, if you've got the balls to do that and it's received well in the press, yeah, I got you back. He got if you it, back. If it's not, we never had this conversation. We're going to do this again, brother, <laughs> because I have so much more to talk about. I love you, Steve. Hey, Taz Performance, Shays De La Shays, enjoy yourself. And i got to get off because they're telling me i got to get off. But we'll come back with Steve Rahosh. He's going to be back before the end of the season. All right. Hope Thank you, you. Hope you guys win the championship. See you next week, baby. <laughs> right. You told me that. <laughs>